Hello. Um, so I'm actually a college student myself. I'll be graduating from the University of St. Thomas in May. And uh, so go back to school when you're 55. Um, and my dad's very proud of me. Uh, he is very proud. Um, three weeks ago, I met Roselle. She asked me to interview my dad. This was very difficult because my dad and I haven't had a good relationship. Most Holocaust survivors and their children don't. I went to Poland last summer with a study abroad uh, with the philosophy department and it was ethics of the Holocaust. I was the only student that signed up. When I returned, I was in shock. Um, before I left, I called up a cousin of my father, who's 92, she was in Auschwitz, her and her brother, she was 14, he was 16, and she said to me, before you leave, I want you to visit Barrack 14 and 17. And I didn't know why. When I was in Barrack 14, and I listened to the guide, I fell, I fell down, because when she said, this is the room that certain things happened to the females, I was in shock. So I came back, so the hurricane happened, my parents, um, lost their home, and now they live about a mile away from me, and I wanted to talk to my dad. I realized when I was in Poland, I have to put the past behind. I have a grandson. He has his first great-grandson. I have to document this. My daughter did a little bio about him when she was in fourth grade, but I have to know it in my heart, because that's part of forgiveness. And so I sat with my parents, and we started to talk about Auschwitz, and I started asking questions. And a couple of weeks ago, I meet Rosalie, and she says, would you please interview your father? So it took me about a week to get my courage up, and we did. And, um, and then she asked me to write an essay. And that essay, I kept editing it with him, and every time we would read a sentence, we both had to stop. And just, I felt his pain. I didn't know that my uncle was a journalist. I'm in the School of Communication. So I'd like to tell you that my father was born a month after Hitler came to power in Romania. One month. His father left him when he was six months old. Family with mom and three sisters. And um, his favorite sister, Bella, he'll tell you about her. So this is my dad, he's 85, he's very strong. And it's really good that we were both here together. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for everybody coming. And I'm not a, a public speaker. But I'm going to try to answer anything that you guys have a question. I'll try to do the best that I can from memory. Okay. My name is Erwin Ritter. I was born in 1933, February 1933, and my father left my mother with four children and just before Hitler came to power, he went into the great world trying to find somewhere where he could settle down and make a new life for himself. He promised my mother, I will send after you as soon as I'm settled. And when I have three sisters and I'm the only man, boy in the family. I'm the youngest. And uh, things happen. Uh, in 39, when I went to Sunday school,
school, I wanted to go back home and I saw a big gathering in the town square. And you know, a kid of six, I was curious to see what's happening. And I stuck my nose in there and I saw that they're torturing a person. This is when the Romanians decided that they're going to part with the Germans. And they wear black shirts and green shirts, and they couldn't decide which one is what. But I found out later on that they were torturing the town mayor. I don't know what it was for. They didn't like something that he did. And the end was that they took him up to a three-story building and they threw him down. So this is, was the beginning. And as I was sticking my nose in to see what's happening, I had long sideburns because my father's family, they were altar religious. And the Romanians, they saw a young kid with long sideburns and they started saying, oh, here we got a Jew boy, a dirty Jew boy, it's Zidane. So they turned around and they started yanking at my sideburns and they were not satisfied till they didn't yank it out with the meat, with everything. I was bleeding like I cannot tell you how. I took off my shirt, I was six years old. And I wrapped it around my neck and I ran home. And I didn't know what's happening. My older sister, Bella, she took a towel, she put it on my head to stop my bleeding. And the landlord that we lived at, he was one of those green shirts. And he said to my mother, I like your daughter. She was 16. She was a beautiful young lady. My mother was scared. She picked us up in the middle of the night and we started roaming around for two years. We went from place to place, wherever we could find where to sleep. My mother was afraid that my, our old landlord is going to come and kidnap my sister. Anyway, this went on for two years. And in 41, my aunt, who lived in Bucharest, my mother's sister, she somehow gathered enough funds to send for us and that we should come up to Bucharest. And we did. Since I was <coughs> the only male in the family, I had to grow up fast. I didn't have any alternative. It was in the war and I had to go and get kerosene. In Romania, there is three, four foot of snow every winter. <clears throat> and I had to go and stand in line from midnight till morning. <clears throat> and I can feel it till today. I have arthritis from the head all the way down. 
But look, I'm surviving and I survived. I'll tell you the story later on that how I rescued my mother from I had two young men coming from the Ukraine, from Transnistria, and I don't know what kind of a relationship it was, but I had two younger sisters, and they fell in love with them. And they were there being in our house, and guess what? One of the neighbors went and called the Sharmadarmeria. That is the police, that we have somebody over there. And they came knocking on the door, and these two young men later on became my brother-in-laws. They jumped out from the window to the neighbor and they ran away. This happened to us two times. The first time that it happened, they took us in, my mother and myself, and I didn't know what's happening. I was a young kid. <clears throat> And uh, they said, okay, since you come from Transylvania, we're going to send you away to Auschwitz. It's a work camp. And you all know what happened in Auschwitz. I didn't like that. I knew the courtyard that we were gathered in. And I took my mother and I said, you follow me. I took told her in Hungarian, and she followed me, and I pulled her through the fence away from there. Guess what? It happened a second time, the same thing. They said, oh, you guys were here before. How come that you're not on the way to Auschwitz? I said to my mother, this doesn't sound good. I didn't know where Auschwitz is. I didn't know what Auschwitz is all about. But they said, oh, it's a work camp. So I did the same thing again. And I put my mother through the fence. And we went away. Uh, it was very hard. A young kid trying to take responsibility what grown-ups normally cannot do. And this happened over and over and over. By the end of the war, going back to 41, my older sister joined a uh, organization, a Zionist organization, which they to me, my older sister was like my mother. I confused the issue because my mother had to work. I did not have a father. So in 41, she met a young man, and he convinced her to go with him, and they sailed to Palestine. The boat was, the name was Struma. It was a yacht built for 150 people. They told us that they're going to put 600 people and it was closer to 800, 765. 69. And the only person that survived from that was one guy 
that he was an Olympic swimmer in 33. And he won some medals. And you can imagine the frigid water in the Black Sea. They were sailing. And later on we learned, we knew all the time that the British torpedoed the boat, but it was not. It was the Russians. The Russians torpedoed the boat. The only survivor was this one man. He was in Canada. Where? Canada. He went to Canada and then, I don't know, he had a documentary anyway. So uh, the thing is that by the end of the war, finally my mother decided we're going to go to Palestine. And guess what? We were on the train past the Danube. We were on the ferry. And we were already in Bulgaria. The Russians stopped the train. And they said, where are you going? We said, we're going to Palestine. Oh, you guys want to go to Palestina? Stalin is going to make a state in Birobijan. I didn't even know where Birobijan is. Birobijan is after Siberia near China. And they, he did. I said to my mother, it doesn't sound good. Again, the same thing over and over. We slept for about a month or so on the concrete. And I went and I got very friendly with the guy that switches the railroad over. And I asked him, tell me, which one goes to Bucharest? And he told me, there is a cattle car coming. I said, can you do something to slow it down? He said, I'll try. So I told my mother, come with me. A kid, 14 year old. I went and I pushed my mother up onto the cattle car and we got to Bucharest. After about six months, my cousin that my father took out from Romania to England, he showed up and he said, oh, you're still alive? He said, I just came back from Auschwitz. He says, over 200 people from our direct family, they were perished. I didn't know what's happening. But later on, he arranged for us to get tickets, and we went through Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Slovakia, in Holland, and we ended up in England. That's how my English, thank God, it is what it is. I hope you guys understand what I'm saying. And basically, it's a long history, and no matter what, I survived by perseverance and not letting go and taking things for granted. What everybody said, oh, we're gonna go with a flock. I never took that in my whole life. <coughs> and that's why I'm here to tell my story.
thanks to my daughter, after 40 years, finally she's finishing college. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. But look, things happen in life. <clears throat> things happen in life because you cannot help it. I hope that I explained most of the things that happened to me during the Second World War, and if anybody has any questions, I'll gladly answer it. Tell them about the time. Tell them about the time of the uh, when you were standing on line for the bread. This was towards the end of the war in 1944, and I was standing in line for one kilo. You, you guys, you know what one kilo is? It's two pounds. <laughs> two pounds of bread, which they called bread. It was chaff from wheat and corn, and that's what they made bread. You couldn't even chew on it if you didn't dip it in water. So I was standing in line, getting my, I took a whole night to stand in line, and I got my kilo of bread and I turned around, and I saw a coupon on the floor. I said, wow, I can get two kilos. So I stood in line. And there was a German soldier in front and there, where everybody was picking up their stuff. And he had a German shepherd. I have scarf till today. The German shepherd smelled that I had fresh bread on me, and he jumped on me, he bit me in the face, my teeth were out, and he bit a piece of my leg out, and they threw me in the gutter. Lucky me that somebody passed by and he had a bicycle, he put me on the bicycle like you see in the movies, you know, putting me across. And he took me across to the other side where the Russians were. They put me down on a bench and they took a regular thread and they sewed me up. Not enough of that, they couldn't find a dog, and I had to get 48 rabies shots. Can anybody imagine how painful that is? It's unbelievable. But I got it. Instead of getting rabies, I had to take the shots. And that's my life story. Dad, tell them, tell them what you did in England. After you arrived to England. Oh, in England, my father was ultra religious. And he put me in a ultra orthodox school. I was there for one year, and I said to myself, I don't want to be a rabbi. That's what he wanted. But I did not want. My trade is I'm a builder. And I learned this very, very young, at the age of 16 in Israel, 
And from there, I ran away and I went for one year at the English public school. After that, I learned a little bit of English. I could mumble. And somebody brought it to my attention that there was a Jewish organization teaching volunteers how to be farmers. And I went there and I learned how to milk a cow, how to plow with a horse, and I did all that. When I got to Palestine at the time, it wasn't Israel yet, in 48, I was able to take advantage whatever I learned in this place where I was volunteering. I came to Palestine, the first thing that they handed me, he says, stretch out your hand, and here is a machine gun. Duh, <laughs> what do you do with it? Don't worry about it, we'll teach you. Anyway, I become an expert. Uh, I got, you guys know what a kibbutz is? Mm -hmm. It's a commune. We built huts for two communes that they came back from Jordan prison. And I, that's when I learned how to do carpentry until today. I am very happy that I learned what I learned in my life. And uh, I didn't let anything pass me, any opportunity pass me that came my way. So here I am. Thank you, Doric. And I told you whatever I remember. And if anybody has any questions, I'll gladly answer. What I suggest we do is simply raise your hand and I'll give you the mic so that anybody in the room can hear the question as well as the answer. So, over here, you would like to start? Well, I'm so impressed that you are not a bitter man. You are, you are not. She said, she's impressed that you're not a bitter man. What, gave, what gives you such hope and, and thankfulness for the life and what you learned? Can you explain that? Look, I don't give up easy. I had two triple bypasses and they told me you'll never walk again. Thank goodness I have a walker. <laughs> I'm not walking as fast as I should, but I manage and I'm here and I'm happy to speak in front of you guys. I'm not a public speaker, but I'm happy to see you guys having an interest in whatever happened. It's a disaster. It shouldn't have happened. But to be able to brainwash a whole nation and <coughs> They followed him. It's pathetic. But hopefully, that it will never happen again. 
But I pray to God that I'm here in the United States and whatever days I still have, I hope to live to see my grandkids grow up and have their own family. It's a pleasure to be here and seeing that you guys have an interest in something that happened that it shouldn't have happened. A whole nation should be able to follow somebody blindly. It's pathetic. Thank goodness to the United States Constitution, and I hope that it will never happen here. But who knows? We have leaders, and they're guiding us. I hope that all of you I try to make things as clear as possible. Uh, when you and your mother and sisters were escaping the horrible conditions, where did you find uh, any place to rest or any kindness or food? We were hiding. Where, where were you hiding? We went to relatives. We went to acquaintances that my mother knew. My mother survived. She was a quilt maker. She was making quilt for people. And that's how we were able to put food on the table. Uh, it was very hard. Where did you stay? I was staying whoever was able to let us in, relatives, my mother's acquaintances, and it wasn't easy. Um, how did you come to the United States? Can you repeat that question? The student asked, how did you come to the United States? Uh, how did you get here? I, again, I spoke English and my wife had a relative. My wife is French. She had a relative, she has a relative who was married to an American person and they came to visit in Israel in the 60s and I learned one thing, don't keep quiet, talk. By talking, I accomplished a lot of things in my life. So how did we get to America? I got to America the day that John Kennedy was shot. We had an interview to the American consulate in Tel Aviv. And the consulate was closed. We had to reschedule and we got another interview and I learned in the Israeli Air Force electroplating, it's electrochemistry. 
And through that, I was able to put bread on the table and I was able to take care of my kids and educate them. Uh, it wasn't easy, but I got to the United States, we flew here, and we rented an apartment in New York, and I worked in the trade, and after a while, after about six or seven years, I got sick because of the chemicals, and I had to give it up. And I remembered one thing, I still know construction. And that's how I survived till today. I know you were really young when it happened, but do you know why it was illegal for the two boyfriends of your sisters to be at the apartment? She wants to know why Svea and um, Lydie couldn't stay at the house. Oh, you Weren't see... They, they, they escaped. They were recruited to a work camp in the Ukraine to dig ditches for the Germans for the German soldiers that they needed ditches to be able to fight. And I don't know how they came to my mother and some, one of them was a relative, a far away relative. His name was Yuda. And the other one was three, and they ran away from the Ukraine, from digging ditches, and that's why the Romanians came and they wanted to arrest them, and they ran away. And I had two sisters, which they were beautiful young ladies. And uh, they kept on coming to the house. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, fine. Let me read this if I can. My name is Isabella, and I'm 11 years old, and I'm writing a book on the Holocaust. What? Can you? Thanks. So this is Isabella. Isabella. She's 11 years old. She's 11. And she asked you, can you explain the emotions and the fear during the time when you experienced the Holocaust? Isabella is 11. She's writing a book about the Holocaust. She wants to understand from you how you felt at 11 years old during the war. I knew um, one thing, that I was the only male in the family, and if I did not stand in line for kerosene to heat the house, or for what they call bread, we wouldn't, we would have starved. So I knew one thing. My mother wouldn't send the girls to stand in line. That was too dangerous. So she sent me. It wasn't easy. Were you afraid? I didn't have any time to be afraid. I wanted to make sure that I'm in line for whatever I came to get. It 
It was very, very hard, but I didn't even have time to think about whether I am scared, the bombs were flying, by the end of the war, the Germans were on one side, the Russians were on the other side, and as kids, this was fun to watch how they shoot at each other and how people they drop. You know, you really don't have any time to think of the danger that is around you. I hope if you need any help, I'll gladly sit down and help you if somebody's going to bring you over to the apartment that we are. We were flooded three times. We were flooded in 15, 16, and 17. So we are renting an apartment. Whatever I can help you, young lady, I'll gladly answer you whatever you want to know. And if that's going to help you write your book <laughs> or write your My Memories, my daughter has a copy of it and she'll gladly let you have it. And if you have any more questions, just call me. Did you ever see your father after the war? Let me answer that. <clears throat> Tell them about the time when you first met your father after the war. You haven't seen him? She's asking, did you ever meet him? That's a sore question. Can you imagine you growing up and not even knowing that you have a father? I was 14 years old and I was introduced, this is your father. Duh. <laughs> Never met the man. Never knew who he was. But his expectation of me was more than I was willing to give. So I, I learned a little bit about my grandfather during the interview. And when they arrived to London, to Manchester, correct? Manchester? No, in London. 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 That was the first time he looked in his father's eyes. Um, the title of my essay is the first time he looked into his father's eyes, just like Eric Clapton. That's the same kind of story. And um, the very first time I heard that story, maybe 10 years ago, my father broke down and cried. He never knew his dad. And I remember him telling me that he felt like he wasn't wanted. And I remember him saying, this boy, I don't want him in the house. And when I interviewed my dad last week, it was really hard for him to remember that. Um, you know, it's really hard. I, can you imagine you finally see your father and you, you think, oh, I'm this long train ride. And then, my dad doesn't remember saying that, but I remember that, and I can imagine the emotions. Mm -hmm. um, and on the way up here, while we were driving, I was asking my father a few things about my grandfather. I don't really remember him, I didn't know him. Um, but apparently my grandfather was a good businessman in London. But there was a situation in England where they didn't allow foreigners to keep their business, and he had a China importing business, and so he had to, on papers, convey his business to a British Englishman lawyer, and when the war 
was over, he was promised to get the business back. When the war was over, my grandfather went to get his business, to claim his business, and he has no claim for it. So he started out with nothing. Um, my dad left England with the youth group after learning the farming skills, left to Israel by himself when he was 16. And in 1955, my parents met in uh, March of 55. They had an engagement party in April. There were many survivors that were reuniting at this party. But finally, my grandparents arrived to Israel together right before the wedding in 1955. And they never really had a good relationship. Uh, my father continued helping his sisters, the two surviving sisters, and his mom. He never had a good relationship with the, with the father, and so I never knew him. And I, I think that we were talking about on the way up here, it's just a generation thing that was going on in the family. Uh, I'll answer you very simply. Imagine that for 14 years, you have not seen anybody. You don't even know how he looked like. All of a sudden they introduce you, duh, this is your father. Okay. What did he do for me? All these years, zero, nothing except that he sent my cousin over and he got us tickets and we went to England. But as far as that goes, my father, to me, he was a stranger. If you meet that man over there, I'm going to tell him that he's my relative. Maybe yes, maybe no. But, you know, it's very strange. When you grow up and you go to a lot of hardship, and all of a sudden they introduce you to a man, I'll use a word. that he he gave his sperm so many of you men don't know how <laughs> anyone else have any question for Mr. Richard <laughs> <laughs> what eventually happened to the two sisters that survived? Uh, one of the sisters met this young man, his name was Sri, and my mother wouldn't let go any of her daughters till they were not married. And they were able to go to Bulgaria, Turkey, Syria, and they went to Palestine. So that's how they got there. My older sister... No, Malka. Uh, Tell them about Malka. Malka, she got again married to this young man, Yuda, and they were not fortunate enough to get to Palestine at the time because the British wouldn't let them in. They pulled them over, they went to Cyprus, and she spent two and a half years in a British camp in Cyprus. And when I met them, I was already a young man 
and I had to start thinking about how am I going to build my life. Anybody knows? Yes. How about your mother? Did she live long? Yeah. Your relationship with your mother, did your mother and you become good companions? Yeah. I'll tell you a story. The relationship with my mother was excellent. But I'll tell you a story that I was 58 years old. I went to a seminar which in California and there was an exercise Tell your mother, tell your father. I mean, we all have issues with my, our parents. And I was completely, at that age, confused. I said, I had a mother, which was my older sister, and all the memories that I remember I put them up on a jar and I put them up on a shelf and I didn't even want to talk about her up to the point where my daughter should have had my sister's name and it was a no-no. And I confused the issue between my mother and my father because I never had a father. The relationship with my mother was excellent. She relied on me for everything. As I told you before, I was a male in the house and I had to grow up fast. I did not have any childhood. So my mother relied on me, whatever she had to get, she told me to get it, and I went and I got it. Didn't she come to live with us? Uh, yes, yeah, she came to live with us for a while. But that's a long time ago. Uh, look, life throws things at your way, whether you want them or not. Thank goodness, guys, you have an opportunity to go to school and learn whatever you want to learn and whatever you want to be. I didn't have that opportunity. I didn't have a childhood, and I had to do what grown-ups do. Anyone else? Did you ever return to the places that you grew up in in Eastern Europe? What? He asked if you've ever been back to Romania. No, I wouldn't like to go back because I have bad memories. You see, I hate to say this, the Romanian nation, as a nation, I call them turncoats. To explain myself, if the Hungarians came in, learn Hungarian. If the Russians came in, I had to learn Russian. If the Germans came in, I learned German in, in school, whatever I had schooling. But 
they are a nation they had to adopt from Dracula all the way to this day. They are a confused nation. You see, Romania is a very, very rich country. They are rich in minerals, and they are rich in oil, and they are rich in anything and everything you name it. Because of their richness, everybody wanted to have a part of it. In the olden days, the main staple was salt. They gave salt to the cows that they should lick the soil, drink more water, and give more milk. Whatever any other nation in Europe couldn't produce, Romania produced. I have no desire to go back because of the memories that I had and hopefully the rest of my life, whatever I have, whether I have one day, one week, one month, one year, ten years, I don't know. I haven't got the foggiest idea. But whatever the one upstairs, let me breathe. And I'm happy to put my foot on the floor when I get up in the morning. And I say, thank God. And at this point, I do have to apologize that we were setting up. I did not get a chance to meet them. I did not learn their names. And that means I know who they are. And I can only ask you at this point in time, please introduce yourself and tell your story as well. Then again, we will open it up to questions as well. And they are descendants of Germans from Berber. No, anywhere you want to, whatever you feel comfortable with. You can stand here, you can go on stage, whatever you like. So, um, first of all, Mr. Ritter, thank you very much for sharing your story. It's very special to hear it, and I think it's very special that we all know what happened. We need to know the truth, so thank you very much that you uh, took the courage to, to share today. Um, my name is Luisa Luprich. I come from Germany. Um, this is my friend Desiree, and um, we are part of the March of Life movement. And uh, we are here today, as Rosalie said earlier, because um, uh, we want to also share from our side, we want to share what, um, what we found out in our families, and um, this is the other part of the truth, but we believe that it's also necessary to, to speak about this. So um, this is the reason why we're here and why we are part of the um, March of Remembrance. And uh, yeah, so for my part, I, um, I grew up uh, knowing about the Holocaust. I, I heard about it in school. We were taught about um, uh, the plans that Hitler had to eliminate Jewish life. We knew this. We we heard about the numbers um, uh, of, of murders that happened during the camps. Um, but from my family, I knew nothing. I, I, we never spoke about this at home. So I never knew really what my grandfather did, maybe what my grandfather did. And when I started asking, I never got an answer. And um, yeah, so when I studied, uh, started to study at the University of Tübingen, um, I came in touch with the March of Life movement, which the March of Life movement is the German version of the March of Remembrance, which uh, was Ali shared about. And um, uh, I, I heard for the first time that um, it's the Holocaust, they're not just numbers, but they're people which have stories. And uh, for the first time, I, I started that maybe I, I want to know more about my family, I want to know more about um, the involvement of my family. So I did researches uh, throughout the last years and I found out through archives that um, three of my grandfathers, great-grandfathers were involved in Nazi crimes. They were um, with the Wehrmacht and with the SS in, in Poland, they were in Russia, uh, they were in former Yugoslavia and Greece. 
and one of my grand grandfathers, he, um, um, he, he was with an SS battalion, he was in Poland, and uh, there he was responsible for um, taking away all the, um, all the properties of people's homes. They were, um, they were taking people to the forest to shoot them, and if they were not shot, then they were um, deporting them. And in, in Serbia, he was, um, I found out through a special archive, um, but he was, uh, um, he was a watchman in a concentration camp, and um, they did daily shootings there. And um, uh, I, I found out about this, and it, it shocked me. It shocked me to, to see this image of my family because I, this is a part that I have never known, and um, I. I started to do more research. I started to speak about this. I started, um, yeah, to, to speak with Jewish people about this, and um, I came to know that it, it's so important that we speak about this. And um, and I was in Auschwitz. I a couple years ago. I was there. I, I saw also the I saw the camp. I saw the hair. I saw the shoes, and I saw what my people did to your people. And um, we, we have to not remain silent, we have to speak about it. And it really broke my heart, it touched my heart. Um, and although I cannot carry the guilt, I, I cannot undo anything, I cannot give back anything that we took, um, but I, I want to make a statement, I want to say that uh, you are not forgotten and that um, forever we will speak about this. And thank you so much for your story. I will forever remember and forever share this in my heart. And um, yes, we, we need to speak about this, it's so important. Yes, my name is Desiree, um, I'm also from Germany, and I started my research for three years ago. And also three of my grandfathers have been uh, involved in the Second World War. And um, a group of me and we went to Belarus last year, and um, I my grandfather already died, and I asked the brother of my grandfather where he was, and he told me that he was with the Wehrmacht in Belarus, and I was standing there next to a 5,000 um, um, grave where Jewish people were buried, and suddenly I really recognized that, it's not, that it was my nation, that it was my family, um, and it is also in my heart because when I grew up, I was always proud to be German. I was always, always proud to be to have blonde hair and blue eyes. And and then I really recognized it was it's also in my heart. It's also part of me. And for three weeks, I was also in Auschwitz, and I saw all these things. And I really knew that it's undeserved grace that Germany still exists. And so <laughs> this is why I also be a part of the mud. Uh, remembrance because I I want to say that that never can happen um, again, that should never happen again and yeah, I feel really sorry for, for what my family did and my grandfather. And now we'll uh, open it up to you as well if you have any questions for them as well. Please raise your hand and I'll get you the mic. Don't be shy. Somebody, I'm sure, has a question for them as well. What do you think accounts for the, maybe the difference in curiosity about the past between the generations? Are you curious about World War II in ways that your parents are not? Or are they just closer to the grandparents, and so it's it's more personal, I guess. Is there a difference in the interest between the generations? Um, I think so too. Yeah, I I um, I mean, I can only share for for my part, for, for my family. But um, I talked about this with my parents, um, what I found out, and um, they were also shocked. But they they said, "Oh, we." Uh, we didn't want to know, and uh, I think it's because they were very, I mean, my parents were born in the 50s, and I think they were closer to the, uh, to the war than I am, and, um, <coughs> yeah, so I don't know really how they truly feel, 
but I think there are differences in the generations, but it's, I think it doesn't matter because it's the same responsibility, I think. Um, uh, it's always a matter of interest, whether you were born close or whether you were born farther away. Um, it's, it's the personal aspect that uh, everybody should care about. I think this is one question I can address a little bit. I mean, obviously, I'm German as well, and I asked my dad once I learned in school about Nazis and the Holocaust what he knew. He was born in 33. And my dad put it this way I was there, I don't want to talk about it. And that was all the ever seven issue. And that was it. But I think that what happens at some point when you go to school, especially when you take history classes, you read really the stories about the parents and the parents, if you have my generation. And I think that piques your interest. Because at some point you learn about your parents telling you who simply based on the truth. And I think that oftentimes that starts the research. I have a question. Oh. <laughs> um, it's okay. So my question is, because I've met Francesca last year, I think it was, when she was here, and I love her so much. Um, I was so honored when she came to speak at the synagogue, and she had three standing ovations. She really spoke from the heart. I come back, so I was born in 58. I'm sure your parents may be a little bit younger than me. I can only imagine that the secrecy and living with a secrecy, you have to let it out some way. So my question is, your, your parents or maybe your peers' parents, so people born in my generation, or even the, the soldiers, your grandparents. Did they have issues with alcohol and abuse where they were trying to cover up so they can cover up their guilt? Do you know what I mean? Like there must have been a way. I could imagine when I was speaking with Francesca, I wanted so much to ask her if parent her parents, your grandparents, if they suffered any kind of abuse, and verbal abuse, physical abuse, because that pain had to have come out some way. Um, I can only say for my grandfathers, both of them were really hard persons. They didn't say to my mom that they love her, or and they always hard and have to work hard and be hard and there was no, how can I say it? They did. Huh? No compassion. No, no. And they, they didn't talk about it and with, it's really what I really recognize now, it's really that the heart was really hard, really closed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can speak for the same. I know this from my grandfather. He's a very pressured person and um, I mean it was his father that was in the war and he was he was a big Nazi he had a problem with alcohol he was an alcoholic he was very abusive to him um, and he left the family so there's I, I, I mean I, I see the anger in my in my family, or I saw the, the anger in my grandfather um, but yeah it's it's a hardness but yeah I don't know more but yeah it's the hardness that did it Perhaps the other part, one of my grandfather, he, um, he, his woman, his wife was raped from the Russian, and and he sometimes he wanted to kill my grandmother. So it was there was no love at all. So he was really he was a really bad man. What do you say to people, the Holocaust deniers? How do you? React to that. Like, what would I say to them personally? I never met someone like that, but I'd probably be a little bit mad, and I would say what I know because I, I obviously I cannot deny it uh, from what I just told you. It's there is nothing to deny. Scientifically, you can even prove it. I think it's nonsense. What avenues have you used for your research 
We know that my late husband's grandfather served under Hitler, but that's all we know. How could we go about finding out more? Um, so we uh, found out from the Bust, uh, it's, I don't know the English words, it's Wehrmacht Auskunftsstelle, it's um, the registration documents from all the Wehrmacht and all the Nazis, they were really good at documenting and uh, bureaucratic stuff and, uh, and you find out many things from there. Um, you, need the, you need the dates, the birth dates, you need the names, full names and the place of birth. So these are the most important uh, things you have to know. But then I, I had, for example, only the name and um, the, uh, the birthday of my, or the year of birth from my great grandfather. And I sent it to archives, not the bus, but what archives, um, because he was in the SS and the SS is not part of the Wehrmacht. So I don't think I can explain it all. You can talk to me personally if you like to, but um, there are many ways to find out, so don't give up. Right. Anybody else have a question? So your great-grandfather and then your grandfathers, when they, what was your understanding of their occupations? when the war was over, and then how did they um, escape any trial activity? Do you mean during the war or after the war? After the war, what did they do for a living? <laughs> My grandfather had normal jobs. They started to work at home. They uh, had a family. Nothing, not, not something special, which are like normal. Um, I know from my great grandfather um, that um, I don't know what he did for a living, um, but I know that he just lived. Um, he lived back in the town where I come from, and uh, from 1961 to 64, there was a um, like the the progress you do before somebody gets to court. I, the, the interviewing, the asking, I, I don't know the elementary right. so far. The, the investigation. Yeah, thank you. Um, and they did this for three years with uh, participants of the SS battalion he was part of. I, I could not find any interview documents from my great grandfather, so I don't know. I think he denied it. Um, but no one, um, like the deeds were obvious, and they had proofs, they had pictures from everything they did. But they, um, none of them was brought to court, none of them was put in prison, none of them was, um, um, yes. Uh, hey there, I have another question. Um, going back to the uh, statement about uh, Germ uh, Germany and uh, the Holocaust, uh, I had a friend of mine who served, who went to the army and who stationed in Germany for a while, and from what I hear is that um, they're saying it's uh, illegal for native Germans to uh, deny the Holocaust and everything else. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's just one of those myths I heard about. <coughs> What he's asking is basically if any kind of like, you know, denial of the Holocaust is a crime in Germany, if you can be prosecuted for that. Well, it's, many people claim this, but uh, I don't know if it's illegal. I don't, I don't know this. I know that uh, certain things like in the Nazi language are forbidden. Um, it's forbidden to do the Hitler greeting, things like that. You, you could get in prison for that, but I, I don't know uh, the... Um, uh, I mean, it's fine, yeah, I was just uh, curious to see how was the laws like... The answer basically is yes, I mean, if, let's say somebody would take a stage like this in Germany and say in public that they think the Holocaust did not happen. Yeah, and then... Okay, then personally, like, you know, very that. likely somebody would basically file an accusation against you with the investigative courts, and indeed they would take you to court. Ah. So here's the answer is yes. Okay. It and, is um, illegal, of course, that doesn't stop people from doing it or staying it in private. You know, but yes, technically speaking, it is against the law. Yeah. I know. Uh, to follow up with that, I was going to ask that. Uh, I don't know if you guys are knowledgeable of it or not, but uh, and this is kind of directed to uh, all three of you who spoke about your experiences uh, with this kind of with these times. 
But um, how do you guys see the way that the American school system will protect will portray history in these times? Uh, do you think they would have a little more detail in it, or do you think they should have quite some stuff? Or I just thought, I thought I'm just wondering your thoughts of it. Do you mean the, how the American school system presents the Holocaust? Yes. I I cannot answer this question. I I can speak for the German part, but I don't know. Maybe maybe an American right, can, give an answer. can you answer that question? Um, well, when my daughter my my daughter was in fourth grade, so she's only thirty. When my daughter was in fourth grade, um, it was in the eighties. She did a Holocaust project. I actually brought it with me. And um, she interviewed her grandfather. And it was moving. Um, when I was a teenager in the, in the 70s, the stories were just coming out. I remember in high school in 74, a group of my classmates, and I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, well, that four years there, they were just starting to talk about it. Um, they do talk about it, and there's Holocaust studies, you know, and um, at Emory University, um, Professor Deborah Lipstadt, you know, she was uh, sued by David Irving. So there's a lot of strong education here, um, but I don't think enough. I don't think that there's enough interest in, in anti-Semitism in this country, and we, we need to teach more about it. And I think we even need to go back, not only for the period of World War II, but we really need to teach the origin of anti-Semitism that goes back to the 1100s, to the 1000s. You know, um, the Christians, I, I'm a student at a Catholic university, and you know, they don't teach all that stuff, and I would, very much like to see a very serious truth coming out about all the anti-Semitism of the entire history, because it wasn't just the Holocaust. It was, you know, Spanish Inquisition, which my father knows that our family goes back there. And I feel like I got cheated out of that history. I really did get cheated out of it. All right. It's pathetic that a whole nation was brainwashed against a religion, but they did not kill only Jews, they <coughs> killed gypsies, they killed Russians, they killed Polish people, Romanian, I mean, anybody who would not agree with their theory, they send them to camp. And it's sad that a nation which is an excellent nation, but you know, when Hitler came to power, he said, for a thousand years, we'll rule over people. It never happened. The reason for it that the British, the Americans, and all the other nations, they woke up to things that happened. We never knew that they were sending people to take a shower and then they were gassed and then they were coming with a bulldozer to push them out and the next people came in. It's pathetic. I only hope and I wish that we as a nation, we're going to wake up and say never again. I want to add 
add something. When I was in Poland uh, last summer, I walked through the Jewish quarters on, a, on the Sabbath. I was really amazed. And there's a flea market in the middle. And Polish people are selling Nazi items, cigarette lighters, helmets, uniforms. I was shocked. One, it's on the Sabbath. Two, it's in the Jewish quarter. <coughs> um, NPR, we have a radio, public radio here, six months ago did, a, did a, um, a program that in Poland they discovered this tunnel system, yes, you know about this, where there's a whole bunch <coughs> of Nazi treasures there. And so you know Poland is really starting to rise up a little bit in the anti-Semitism right now. How can your generation keep these Nazi things from leaving Germany so they don't end up in Poland being sold and other places because you know we have this rise in neo-Nazis of the young generation and, and um, I hope that Germany does a stronger job standing up and saying no and we can't let this stuff out and maybe get, maybe go all around Europe and, and go to these flea markets and take them all away. You know, because it's pretty sad to see these things. Talk about a slap in the face and a kick in the stomach in the Jewish quarter to see Nazi items right there. If I can add on just for, for a moment, I mean, I did obviously most of my education in Germany came here for private school. And so I have a degree master's degree in Germany with a focus on the flat right. And I thought for a while it had been very well trained. But when I came to the United States, when I realized that we have been taught basically about what the Nazis did. When you come to the United States, at some point you learn about what the Jewish religion actually is about. What is Jewish culture like? And it's, you kind of learn what happened to the people, but you didn't learn to understand the people themselves. And I think in hindsight, that for me is the big difference. And when you study the United States, the Holocaust, you must only learn what happened and what the Germans did. But you also, in some ways, humanize the people, right? And various people and victims. And that, I think, is in Germany still oftentimes very hard. I mean, if I look, I mean, this is not from just a reflection, but I don't think we have many books on Jewish culture and life not reading this. Anyone? Yes? Which one is? So this is to kind of follow up on his question over there. Um, how does Germany, the German education system, present the Holocaust? Um, so during school, we, we started with this topic, I think I was in maybe in sixth or seventh grade. Um, and it, it came in a couple subjects. I had it in German. Um, in history, um, and, and uh, it's a subject we call educa like education, um, and it lasted for, for a while. Like I had it until my 13th school year, and Germany we used to have 13 school years. Um, afterwards, if I look back, I think it's not enough. It's uh, we, we don't learn enough. We don't. Uh, I think sometimes even we look at the wrong things. It's as I said a little bit. It's it's a lot about numbers. It's very the German way, it's very uh, straight and very uh, cold. And I heard some of my, my student friends say, oh, I can't hear it anymore. And I think we, we cannot say this. I mean, of course, it's, it's huge. It's a huge topic. It's not nice to look at. But we cannot, we, we, I mean, it, this leads to the fact that people start to deny it and that people don't want to hear it anymore. But I think this is the wrong way. So uh, we need to work on it. Yeah. I think also a problem is that it's not that personal. So a uh, key would be that every uh, student has to look at, your, at his own family and do research, and then it would be something different. But so it's history, and you have it, and then it's done. I have a question. I was wondering, um, you've heard of all family members that were Nazi killers of Jewish people and say underprivileged or in, um, deformed people or whatever different kind of atrocities. Have you ever been around people who say that they were 
able to help save a family, save an individual that was Jewish, um, as we call or a righteous Gentile. Um, have you ever heard of those kinds of stories? I heard some, but it's not so much than the other stories. They have families, they helped Jewish people, or they said it's not right, or something like this, but it's not so much than the other stories. Yeah, I'm saying you, there are other stories, but I, um, I don't hear them a lot. Last question, over here. Um, I think you talked about, oh, I think you talked about it earlier about like learning about Nazis and you know the Holocaust and everything. You kind of just believe they were in class. Is that what you'll say, correct? Like, did does your teacher ever just say, oh yeah, that was like a really bad part of our history? Because like American history, we kind of say, oh yeah, the whole thing with the Native Americans that was pretty bad, but we don't really like learn about their culture. Do y'all do the same thing? Like your teachers for the Holocaust kind of say. Oh yeah, that was kind of bad, but just glaze over it. Or do y'all go into depth about it? I don't think I, I couldn't hear she you wants, well. She wants to know like if they sort of minimize the history of the Holocaust. The teachers? Yeah. Teachers? I mean, for, for my experience, not so much, but the students do. And, um, Okay, then I would like to express my thanks to you as well for coming here and sharing. I think it must be very difficult for you as well to share. And I would like to give a round of applause.